when you're starting out as a young writer, you often look up to great writers of the previous generation or half a generation ahead of you like Richard. And so when I was uh, a young man, when I was at a college like Tulane, I had the in incredible good fortune of being in the annual Best American Stories collection with Richard in 1986, and I couldn't believe my good fortune. It just seemed <laughs> so lucky and wonderful. And there are two things that you do as a, you know, all, all writers, writing is a kind of advanced reading in a way. And so if you're, if you're gonna be a writer, you're gonna be a very careful reader. And so you're not just hoping for yourself, but you're also hoping for the people that you're modeling yourself on. Um, so the only thing that's better than having gotten to a wonderful place where I could be interviewing Richard on the stage is what happened to Richard after 1986. So thank you for being a model to the, all the people I grew up with. That was the only story I ever had in The Best American. <laughs> Communists, it was great. <laughs> um, but before we talk about uh, Richard's new book, um, um, say your name again, forgive me. D. D. D was talking about how uh, Richard and his wife have relocated to New Orleans, which is a wonderful compliment to the city. And I know all of us have read his new novel, but he shares some thoughts about New Orleans in the book, which I thought I would read. <laughs> I remember, this is from the middle of, uh, of Be Mine, which came out last summer. I remember the first time I flew into the crescent city of New Orleans and could see below me the heart of that gaudy, bruised metropolis, arrayed precarious among the great river's epic turn toward the Gulf. Right away, I knew that underlying all that went on there was a sense of denial, burning like fever, and of self-willed recklessness and possible mania. <laughs> so <laughs> um, tell me your thoughts about New Orleans. Is that, is that, that's, Frank's, that that's Frank's sense of it and not yours. Well, that pretty well complies with my sense of it, uh, Frank's sense of it. Once in a while, you know, when you write books, you actually write something that you believe. And, and that was, one, that was <laughs> one of those instances when I wrote something that I believe. But I, but I was realizing I was sort of setting up to have to write something yeah. about New Orleans because I just had it in my brain to do it. So I, 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 I just dreamed up what I, what I wrote and then I realized it was exactly what I think. Because, uh, you know, I've been living in New Orleans off and on since 1947. So um, wow. um, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm owed the opinion that I can have. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny what uh, you were saying that you didn't know what you felt really until you wrote it. Uh, I'm sure all of us are heavy uh, Michel de Montaigne readers. He's that French essayist. And he said a great thing that I always think about uh, and talk to students about, which is uh, to find out what I thought I wrote, which is just what you were saying. Um, and, and some, but, but, it's, but it's often the case, and you know this because you write stories. And, you know, in T.S. Eliot has a wonderful line in which he said, you, you don't write basically to express yourself, you write to get away from yourself. And, and often it is the case when you write something, you, you, it, it's not that you're lying, you aren't lying. You're, you're providing some other referent for the reader to use and it just may not be the one that you yourself comply with. Um, and with, uh, with our comparisons of T.S. Eliot and Montaigne now squared away. Yeah, we're good. Um, we're good. I, I wanted Chuck, to catch check you those up. boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna <laughs> sign off on it here. I, I want to catch you up on what's happened to Richard uh, from my perspective as a reader and someone turning to Richard as a role model since 1986. Um, one of the things that was interesting about Dee's introduction is what basically happened is that they ran out of awards in America to give to <laughs> Richard, so. Oh, I don't um, know. No, the Spain Award. <laughs> no, you're on the international circuit. I'll be, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> um, but, you know he's most famous for the Frank Bascom novels, which are which have brought us here this morning. Um, what was interesting when I was thinking about the great opportunity I had this morning to talk about uh, Richard and for us to talk, I looked at those titles again and I saw that in a really odd sense, in a way you might or might not be aware of, each title represents a phase in your career. Oh. So think about it. So we'll be going to Be Mine, which is the most recent one. Um, but if we start, uh, we start with the sports writer and then Independence Day and then Lay of the Land, I would love to talk about your career that way. Um, 
When you started writing The Sports Writer, it was 1984, 1983? It was 1982. 82. Now, it's an amazing title that, uh, that I imagine must have been very meaningful to you in a way that was very different for the reader. You already had published two novels, and you had been to Hollywood before that. Could you talk right. about that a little bit? Just how you, how you came to writing and then your experience with the first two books? Well, I, I, I came to write to being a writer or trying to be a writer uh, in, in 1968 after failing at, at everything else. Uh, <laughs> failed, failed, I mean, I didn't abjectly fail, but I just didn't work, it didn't work out in law school, the Marine Corps. Uh, I was a teacher in Flint, Michigan. I, I was offered a job with the CIA, which Christina wisely said, don't take that. <laughs> And so I was kind of looking around. We were about to get married in um, 1968 in the winter. And I just decided one thing I hadn't failed at yet <laughs> was to try to be a writer. And I'd written a couple of little sort of inconsequential stories that a teacher of mine had liked. And he said to me, he said, you know, Ford, he said, you could, you could, you could make a go of this as long as you never expected to make a living doing mm -hmm. it but you, you're gonna have to teach to do it. And I didn't think I was trained to be a teacher, so that, I didn't take that very seriously. Huh. And it was Christina who said to me, uh, we were getting ready to get married in about two weeks, and, I, and she said to me kind of quizzically, she said, well, what do you think you might do after we get married? Which is a reasonable question for a young bride to ask her soon to be husband. And I said, well, I think I might try to be a writer. I mean, I could as easily said I was gonna be a small engine repairman and, and she said, that's great, she said, do that. She said, I'll get a job, and you stay home and write stories. And I thought, well, that, that's a pretty good idea. And so that's, you know, that basically is what we did, because we don't have any children. We, I stayed home and wrote stories and books, and she has a, a proper career, which, brought her, which is what brought us here, because Christina was the head of city planning for the city of New Orleans, and the uh, executive director of the New Orleans Building Association. But the, um, the title of the sports writer, I'm, I'm very gullible. So as a young reader, I thought, isn't it fascinating that Richard Ford is writing uh, his narrator as a former or a current sports writer? It was only recently that I found out that the reason you were writing about that was because... It, it was another one of those things that I had <laughs> failed at. Uh, I, I, had, I had, I'd quit, I'd yeah. written those first two novels, which nobody read. And I thought, well, you've had your shot, so go get a job where you earn some money. So I got a job sort of as a, sort of a serious freelancer for Inside Sports. They were giving me lots of work. And then it went out of business right out from under me because Newsweek owned it. Newsweek sold it to somebody else. So I went over to Sports Illustrated with my little clips, and I thought, well, I'll get a job there. And the guy said to me, no, he said, you're not a sports writer, you're a novelist. Huh. I said, no, no, I used to be a novelist, said, but now I'm a sports writer. He said, no, you'll be too hard to edit. <laughs> and, and they were right, because when they edited you at Sports Illustrated, they stepped all over what you were doing. You just kind of gave them a couple of ideas, and then they would run with it. That's the, that, that's the loose organization. Yes, the timeline works that way. Um, but the interesting thing to me, uh, for people who are writers in the audience, is... Think of the wonderful pressure Richard had taken off himself because you had had two novels that are different than the novels that you've since written and they hadn't been as successful as every writer wants. And so if you're sitting down to write what is gonna be your first really strong novel and it's called The Sports Writer, you're not, it's not called The Novelist. And I wondered if that gave you a certain kind of freedom to be more relaxed. Because in a way you were saying, I've accepted this role that I don't especially wanna play and that's what this is gonna be titled, so I can write this in a much more relaxed state than I've written I never thought ones. about that, David, that, that's, that, that's interesting. I, I do know that when I set about writing what became the sports writer, I had, I had the idea that I had to do it all differently, that in writing those first two novels, I had written out of about two thirds of my brain, and which happens to young writers, um, and I had, to, I had to write a book that used all of my brain and everything oh. I knew. I, I, when, when Updike died, uh, Adam Gopnik said this, wrote a little a bit about Updike in The New Yorker, and he said that, that Updike's books were great because he got everything in. Huh. He got everything that he knew, everything that he felt, everything that he thought, not about himself, but just what the book needed. He filled the book with everything, and I thought, 
I've got to figure out some way of writing books that lets me get everything in. And in particular, this, this whole notion of a book that's funny, but at the same time, almost tragically serious. Right. Yeah. At, uh, holding those two things in mind, like the two masks of drama, I, I thought that's what a great book does. A great book has tragedy in it, and it has comedy in it at the same time. And I, I still think that. I, we were just, I was just talking to, to my friend Bruce Weber, and we were just talking about the fact that, that that's one of the ways in which I calibrate what a great book is, whether it has bliss and bail in it <laughs> at the same time. Um, it's funny, Nabokov, uh, the Russian-American writer Vladimir Nabokov, said that he couldn't read something that wasn't in some way funny. Yeah, but, um, I feel the same way. But there's a fascinating thing that then happens. So after the sports writer, Richard was one of the leading novelists. And those of us who were your fans were excited to watch how you were progressing. And then in 1995, the mid-90s, as you know, was a great time for American fiction. Laurie Moore was writing at her best. David Wallace was about to publish his novel in 96. But Independence, came, Independence Day came out in 95. And I've always thought that title was a very fortunate one, too. Because that was, forgive me for saying this, that was when Richard became an acknowledged master. Um, do you guys know who Elizabeth Hardwick is? Um, she was Robert Lowell's wife, and she is the best critic. She's the, I mean, if you guys like, like or know Pauline Kael, she is the Pauline Kael of books. And when she Independence was. Day, and forgive me because Richard very intelligently doesn't read uh, reviews, of, uh, reviews about his work. But Elizabeth Hardwick writing something is flattering about you. Do you mind if I read the last paragraph of oh, her no. review of Independence Day? <laughs> okay, perhaps, perhaps I'll hold back. <laughs> um, Independence Day, if you're taking measurements like the nurse in a doctor's office, I mean, what a dream to have gone from wanting to be like Frank Defford, right? Yeah. Being at Inside Sports, having it closed down, and then taking a real chance on your talent, on what only you could do. And then here it is. I think only nine years after the sports writer. Independence Day, if you're taking measurements like the nurse in a doctor's office, writes Elizabeth Hardwick in the New York Review of Books, might be, might be judged longer than it need be. Sorry, a little. Um, but longer for whom? Every rumination, each flash of magical dialogue or unexpected mile on the road with a stop at the payphone is a wild surprise tossed off by Richard Ford's profligate imagination as if it were just a bit of cigarette ash. The sports writer and Independence Day are comedies, not forces, but realistic, good-natured adventures, sunny, yes, except when the rain, it raineth every day. The new work, Independence Day, is the confirmation of a talent as strong and varied as American fiction has to offer. And so one of the things that I thought about the title was you became independent with that novel you didn't have to worry in the same way. When the novel came out, it was the first novel ever to receive in the same year uh, both the Faulkner, the Penn Faulkner Award, and the Pulitzer Prize. So that title is also fortunate in that you become independent from certain kinds of pressures. And I stole that, I stole that uh, title from Springsteen's song. Also from The Holiday. Yeah, yeah well, from The <laughs> Holiday, too. But I don't think I would have written that book if, if, if Springsteen hadn't written his wonderful little melancholy ode to fathers and sons, which is um, called Independence Day. Yeah, I've, and I have lived long enough to tell him that, which, which makes, me, makes me happy. What did he say? Oh, he was, he was good about it. He was, <laughs> he was good, he is a good guy. Uh, but that, I remember Christina and I, after, just when we finished the sports writer, we were driving from where we lived in the Delta in Mississippi, we were driving down here and um, and I was playing that on the on the on the tape, um, in the car. Uh, it's, it's the, 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 the signature line is "Just say goodbye. It's Independence Day." That's great. And I never thought of independence as being something you had to say goodbye to earn. And it, for me, that even though it may seem prosaic to anyone, to me that was a new idea. Mm -hmm. Say goodbye for independence. And so I thought, well, I said to Christina at the time, I said, I'm going to use that. I said, I'm going to just have to uh, uh -huh. take that from Bruce. But how did it feel to have gone from being at a Sports Illustrated read-alike that had failed to receiving two of the largest prizes in American literature in the same year? First person to ever do that. Well, it felt really good. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 
what you it's what you do with how that yeah. feels is what's important. It's, it's it's not that you sit down and bask in whatever glories that come with it. It's that it's what I felt was well maybe I'm actually not bad at this, huh. and maybe I could write something else. Maybe maybe there's an audience for for these books, not necessarily another Bascom book, just but for whatever else I might write. So you know it, all of that is wonderful. But then you've got to go back to work. You have to go sit down and think to yourself, well, I'm starting over again. And uh, that's, a, that's a cold uh, bath. <laughs> <laughs> which, of course, leads to the next title, which, again, these are Frank Bascom titles, but they work very well for your career as well. You have become one of the acknowledged masters of your field. And you look around you to see what that means, and you get the lay of the land. Right, that is the title of the third Bascom book. Which is really long. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm curious, what it, it's very different to write in that position, isn't it? Because in a way you don't have, one of you and I both, both knew David Wallace a little bit, and difficulty he had after his very exciting 1996 was he didn't have a, I mean, he just said this, he didn't have a brass ring to pursue. Was it hard for you to, once you know that you are in a very different position than most other writers, how are you motivating yourself, and was it difficult? No, I live with the right person. So it's never hard for me to, uh, to motivate myself. Um, I'm, I, I cast all off. There was nothing else to do. And you could also make, you could make too much about how hard writing novels is. If, if it was really hard to write a novel, I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> so I just thought to myself, this is what you do. And, and you, have, you have this voice, and you have this storage of, of raw material. Uh, you have to do something with it. One of the great things about being a novelist is the same things go through my head as go through anybody else's head. And, but in most anybody else's head, you just kind of forget about it. I save it. <laughs> I, I write it all down. And I have use for it. So it, 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 it intensifies one's, you know, purchase on everyday life. And so it, 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 was, it was natural to write that book. Maybe too natural, because it's so damn long. <laughs> um, and since at that time you just have control of your schedule, you have control of when you're publishing books, I'm curious what your schedule was like then. Like, who were you reading at that time? Were there moments, were there moments when you thought, OK, I'm having a hard time writing now, or were there times when it was easier? Because every writer dreams of getting to that point, and I'm curious, again, what you were using both as reading fuel while you were working on books in the early part of the century, and then also what your schedule was like. Well, I was trying to read books that were not going to be stylistically influential. Hmm. So there are certain kinds of high stylists. There are, I wasn't reading Alice Munro. Hmm. I wasn't reading Barry Hanna. I wasn't reading Tom McGuane. I was often reading books in translation, which, which hmm. wouldn't sort of uh, back up into what I was doing. Um, I, I was just trying to read books that were funny and um, dark at the same time. I was reading Something Happened by Joe Heller. I was reading uh, Fan's Notes by Fred Exley. I was reading um, Walker Percy. I was just reading things that I thought would, would, would be congenial with what I was thinking, but not make me, not make me veer to one side or, an, or another. I mean, it's, it's I think it's important that you be reading when you are writing, for sure. But you've got to be careful that you don't end up reading somebody who's going to sort of take you off your own rails. I guess what I'm also asking, just because uh, as a fan of yours and then also as someone who does similar work, um, Tolstoy, you guys obviously know who Tolstoy is, right? Um, so in the, uh, he was in a similar position. This is New Orleans. Yeah, <laughs> this is why I was brought here, because of <laughs> my, uh, my wide acquaintance uh, with fine novels. Um, but Tolstoy, in the, by 1870, was like Spielberg, since the, um, the basic entertainment experience is the best one you could have was a good, involving, long novel. And so even after War and Peace had been a giant success all over the world, he had the same anxieties that any starting out novelist had. And so when he was, before he wrote his next long novel, he kept making false starts at things. And he was losing his drive to be a writer. And what he did, and this is what I was asking about your reading, is that one day when he was having a terrible time writing, he just pulled down his favorite writer, Alexander Pushkin. And he read the Captain's Daughter uh, collection for what he said was the seventh time. And he said, never have I been more impressed with Pushkin, nor anyone else for that matter. 
Mm. And he said, it removed all my doubts. It reminded me of why I read and the kinds of things I like to write and the pace at which I like to write. And I'm curious who would be a writer for you like Pushkin, where if you had a dark morning of the soul, you would go to the bookshelf and say, yes, this is the kind of stuff that I like to do. Well, what, well, is it Percy? Well, the, well, well Percy at one point was for sure, uh, Updike, not so much because the books are connected, yeah. but, but but because, um, again, the books were so full. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to read books that were, that, that were, was an alternate, an alternate existence that I, you know, the uh, Elaward book, the Elaward quote about, there is another world, but it is in this world. <laughs> I wanted to go into that other world. Uh, and, and, and one of the things it does when you read is it just, and I think probably this is what t you were saying about Tolstoy, if you read somebody else who can write a novel, you think to yourself, well, shit, I can do that. <laughs> you know, I can write another, I can write a novel. It isn't that hard. I mean, you know, I always say monkeys can write novels and plenty of monkeys have written novels. <laughs> um, but is there a novel that you would turn to uh, in distress? Is there a writer you would turn to if you had like a, a week where you were totally cold or you thought, why am I doing this? Is there someone you I've would never call had a week like? I've never had a week like that. Really? You've never? Okay, what about two days? Let's say you had a long weekend. A long weekend when you're just uh, having a hard time getting back to work. You know, that's kind of like a writer's block. And I always think that I'm not smart enough to have a writer's <laughs> block. I just go back and do it. So you've Because never... there's just lots of days when you go sit at your desk and nothing happens that you, know, you don't make anything happen that you like. And then at the, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, you go have a drink. Or you go to the gym, <laughs> and I then you now, come back yeah. the next day, and you think, "Oh well, I, I can do this." You know, there, there, it is such. It is true that you can make trouble for yourself, and I try not to make trouble for myself. I go just ahead. think to myself, "I can do this. I have done this. I will do this again." So, you know, you can <laughs> and take then, yourself yeah. too seriously in a way. Oh come on, Tolstoy is both terribly self-serious, but also he's just trying to get his work done. He's like, yeah. I'm having a hard time with this book. Yeah. Um, you know, Frost's great line about poetry, poetry is the last vestige of your childhood. You must go at it somewhat irresponsibly. That's great. And I, that's how I've always done it, somewhat irresponsibly, because if you, start, if you start to tighten up, then your book tightens up. And what you're constantly wanting to do as you get along into a long novel, you want to keep pushing out the sides of the book. You want to let more things in. You want to make yourself uh, available to things that you uh, could have only become available to because you've written this far. And if you tighten up, well, then your brain tightens up. It's, it's not good. It's just... um, I'm going to abandon this line of questioning. That's all right. No, you will. No, um, no, no, I just was curious. But there's nothing I was wrong with this line of questioning. No, no, but I was curious what your what your what the book that you carry as an emergency spare tire in the back of the car was. But I want to move on to something. I, I don't. I don't yeah. have one. But but what if what if the car has a flat? You will well, need that literary spare tire. I don't know. Okay. Well, I don't know. Call, call me if it ever happens. Oh, I, I will. I'll, I'll, okay. Good. Um, so then here's the, so this is the last title so far in the Bascom novels. There is a longer gap. Each book before was on a decade basis, right? Nine years or 10 years between each one. And then there is a 17 year gap. And this is when Richard does something that I as a reader have never seen before, which is you published that book when you were uh, in your later 70s? 163. 163. Um, there have been many uh, American writers who have continued to publish up to that age, but Richard is the first writer whose work I know well to do his best novel at this age. Well, and it was you. staggering to me, and that's why I'm here, because for me, it's not just that writers have those kinds of crisis moments, and I don't know if this matches your experience, but readers have those crisis moments too. Uh, I hadn't liked a novel, really, for about three or four mm -hmm. years, and I picked your book up, and it reminded me why I love to read. Well, it was you. shocking to me how good it was. I don't know how many of you have also read it yet. Um, well, you can believe the conventional wisdom which says that when you get old, you, you're not I any was good anymore. I was building to a punchline. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so we're just going to do another take on this, where Richard didn't come in, and we're going to slide into my thing, and this will be the last of my time. I don't want to step on your punchline, though. No, of course, we're close. Um, <laughs> 
So if you think about that title, he knows how good the book is coming out, and the sports writer is who he was when his career wasn't as strong. Independence Day is when he is able to write whatever he wants. The lay of the land is someone calmly looking around at their domain. And now it's 2023, and he turns to the reader and he says, be mine. Yeah. Which is a request that you're making to us, and the book stands up to it. Thank you. Come on, that was a solid joke. No one no, went no. for it. I was building to it for 22 minutes. I'm watching the clock. I was like, yeah, it's going to be big. It's a good yeah. title. Uh, I thought it was a good title because it has a, it, 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 as you say, it sort of radiates in several directions yeah. at once. Uh, um, but, but as I, as I was going to say when I was stepping on your line, I'm sorry. No, you, uh, I said, I, you can believe the conventional wisdom about anything and let it have the influence that it has upon you, or you can think to yourself, this has nothing to do with me. Hmm. This conventional wisdom which says when you get to be, I'm 80 now, when you, when you get to be 79 or 78, your best work is behind you. I just never dreamed that that could be true. And I'm trying to sort of fashion up a little novel in my mind now, and I'm thinking to myself, there's no reason I can't write this book. I mean, unless I, you know, croak. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a staggering... Alice Munro has stayed strong pretty much the whole way. Absolutely. Got Until better, she basically yeah. just sort of phased out. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but if you think about, uh, Richard had mentioned John Updike, you know that his work ceased to be as strong by the time he turned about 69 or 70. But he could do so many other things. He's a fine golfer. He, well, but he's a really good essayist, yeah. a wonderful essayist. And he thought he was a good poet, and he, and, <laughs> and he could write poems. But, you know, he was so multi-talented. I'm not. And so, I mean, you know, what, what, but to be able to sit quietly in your room is the source of all happiness. I can sit quietly in my room. And, and for me, that is the source of everything. But think about, like, uh, Nabokov, who has an amazingly long career. He publishes his first novel when he's 24 in 1924. And then he publishes his last one in 74. So a half century career, but it's not strong. Whereas here you're doing something that really has never, hasn't happened for an extremely long time, which is a writer is getting better as they enter their eighth decade. And what was interesting to me, and I wonder if this matches other people's experiences, that's such a rare thing that what I was hoping was that you would be in the back of an open car going down like Wall Street in the canyon between the buildings. <laughs> and they're like, I guess I missed that. Paper. Yeah, why wasn't that done? <laughs> Because to me, that's a fascinating thing. That is an amazing achievement to have well, written that book. And I wanted more thank parades. You. I never thought about that. Um, I just, you know, again, I try to, I try to not think about things like that. Um, are, you, you know, are you writing at the top of your game here? I think to myself, if I'm doing it, I'm writing at the top of my game, or I wouldn't be doing it, wouldn't be able to do it. And I have this notion that if I'm writing a book or a story or an essay, I can't make it go forward Un unless I'm really happy with everything that came before. I can't sort of push beyond something and say, well, this is crappy. I'll come back and fix this later. I just don't do that. Huh. I just think I'm not going to go another inch until I'm thinking to myself, this is as good as I can make it. But then there's another question that I have for you about the book. And how many people have read the book yet? OK, so I, you may have the Tell same the question. Tell the truth. <laughs> okay, so uh, hands again, because Richard is asking, so we'll see more hands. Okay, great. Um, I've read it. Yeah, yeah, so I should, yeah, I, let me add. Um, but one thing that really interested me, there's a great line, uh, and this is how a lot of us responded to your work as you were doing it. Um, Proust said this wonderful thing about uh, a writer that he, a fictional writer, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's George Sand in reality, but he said that when he was reading George Sand as a young person, I longed to have some opinion, some metaphor of his upon everything in the world. And that's how, of course, a lot of us began to Would you say that again? I didn't, I, didn't, sure. I, didn't, I didn't hear it. Um, I longed to have some opinion, some metaphor of his upon everything in the world. Oh, I see. Isn't that great? I so see. yeah, he's talking about, I think about George yeah. Sand. Um, and that's how a bunch of us felt about you. And then it was very fascinating to see what your opinions were on life in this book. And I'm curious if anyone else noticed this. Um, for example, uh, Frank is looking uh, at himself uh, in, a, in a coffee cup. My late, view, my late life tendency to view myself in grainy, unflattering lights had been switched on too high. It's similar to turning on the camera in your phone and suddenly viewing yourself. 
horse-faced, unsmiling, hollow-eyed, needing a shave, staring uncomprehendingly back like a criminal. <laughs> this deflating experience can actually bring on curdling sensations of personal fraudulence. <laughs> and it's a great phrase, isn't it? Um, but the thing that I'm asking about is that um, Frank's sense of the world, with all of your effective powers as a writer, right, your, your powers to, uh, to evoke and then to express, his sense of life is not sunny. And that was one of the great wild surprises to me. As I was reading it, I kept marking in the margin. Do you guys know that Marcus Aurelius was an unbelievable stoic? Of course, that's common knowledge. So whenever we're, there's the Marcus Aurelius burger at a Burger King, et cetera, et cetera. But I kept, I kept writing in the margin, the ideal book for Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> um, were you, did you notice um, how many of the observations that Frank was having were ones of sort of dissociation or of ones of life? For example, here, let me read you guys another one so that you don't have to take my word for it. Deep understanding of other human beings is greatly overrated. <laughs> so that is, that's the fruit of your examining, you know, your neighbors, all of us in this room, and I was very curious about that. I have a long list, by the way. Well, um, it just so happens that I agree with both of those, <laughs> but I don't, I need not, yeah. I need not. In fact, when you get to the end of the long quote about seeing your face in your, in your phone and it's horse so face good. and yeah. some grainy guy needing a shave. The, the part of that little, that little passage that means anything to me is when I get to the end of that passage, and then Frank says, we'll create a sense of personal fraudulence. I, I just made that up. <laughs> and Because I, I thought to myself, all right, I've got this description of, of something that everybody who reads it will recognize. Everybody, because we've all done that, we've all suddenly had the camera on on our phone and seen that we are now in the camera and we don't look like we want to look. <laughs> but I had to say, you get to the end of that passage and you say, and therefore what? And then that's the question you have to answer as the novelist. You have to say, if this happens, then what is that, what is that, what's the consequence of that? And personal fraudulence, I thought, well, that makes sense. I like that. I'd never thought about it before. And don't, I don't even necessarily believe it. But I, <laughs> but I wrote it. Um, but, but, but let me say one more thing. What you want in writing a passage like that is for the reader to have a conversation with your book. The, for the reader to say, I see the equation that Ford has created in this line. Is that true? Is that true of me? Is that true of life in general? And you may come to the conclusion, because you know we're just like Richard Wright said, we're just throwing sparks into the darkness here. Um, we're, whatever you come to believe and whatever you come to think when you have that conversation, that's what I want. I don't necessarily want you to use my book as your Bible for the rest of your life, because I might say just the opposite of the next passage later. So you, you're, you're, you're I'm always writing passages in which I'm thinking about the reader, thinking about what the reader's gonna think, what the reader's gonna believe, reject, buy, not buy. And so it's, it's, it's not me writing in a vacuum. It's always with the antiphonal reader out there. No, it's amazing just to, to quote from Proust again. Proust said a great thing about his own book, which I think is true for the books that we love. He said that he meant his book to be, his long six volume book to be a kind of optical instrument uh, through which the reader could look and read her own life, which yeah. is kind of what you were saying about. I mean, the, the, a book, a, a, a novel that I would write should have the effect on the reader of life as lived. Okay, but with that said, here is another quote. Uh, this is uh, Frank Bascom's son is talking to Frank, and uh, he's talking about some relationship ideas he has, and Richard's narrator says, your dick is not connected to your brain. It does its own thinking. Great literature is mostly about that. <laughs> I'm, so okay. I'm so happy I wrote that line. It doesn't, make, it doesn't make any difference if I believe it or not. I just want to be the person who, who wrote it. Okay. And then um, <laughs> uh, he's then talking to us, and it's a beautiful story. Um, uh, many of the, uh, all the Bascom books seem to be organized around holidays. Yeah. And, 
Frank and his son are now driving to Mount Rushmore because it is the Ur National, the Ur American Monument. And so Frank turns to his son and says, isn't this trip any fun? And uh, his son replies with a negative, even though he's agreeing. He says, no, it's good. And then Frank thinks, yeah, no, the entire human condition in two <laughs> words. <laughs> well, so I just, they're all in one direction. Well, you know, you want to get it all in. <laughs> if, you, 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 know, I, you, you see a word someplace or you see a phrase someplace. I've got my little notebook right here in my pocket. It, it, and, and what you think is, I just want to put that in my book someplace. I just want my book to contain that. I don't know how it will contain that. I don't know how I'll make it make sense. I don't know if I can make it make sense, but I'm going to stick it in there. And when I like the line about your dick not being attached to your brain, um, I just want it in there. <laughs> and then if I don't make it sufficiently. Isn't that the kind of thing that Dick thinks, basically? I just want it in there. Say, say, say it again? <laughs> Isn't that the Dick talking again? I just want Well, it, it could be. <laughs> for, for, Maybe that that's all joke. men ever talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the book is beautiful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, invite people from the audience to ask questions in a second. But, um, but the book is so beautiful. And uh, the feelings in the book are resolved in this amazing passage that's about 50 pages from the end. Um, Frank used to be living very wealthy uh, in Haddam, New Jersey, by the water. And he writes this astonishing passage. Did, do you want to read it? Or? Oh, I can't read it. Okay. I can't see. I don't, oh, it would I, I don't, be so good. If I had the book, I'd read it. But I'd, but I'd, OK, because I could make it really big. It'd be so much better if he read it rather than Anybody writing. have a book? <laughs> Come on, why would you want me oh, to Oh, you read have it? a book. Yeah. No, no, but here. But I don't, but I I don't, don't want to read it. it off that thing. Uh, OK. I'm, okay. <laughs> But no, you have a book in your lap, I, I, David. I only read I, I only read ebooks. You but do you lap. know? Okay, do you know what page this no. is? No. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I don't want this counted against our time. Okay. This is one of those things where you're at a presidential debate and you want the time added back on. I want <laughs> okay. 45 seconds added back on. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to. You'll do probably it. do it better than I would anyway. No way. Um, when I lived in my fancy beach house on the Jersey Shore, circa mid 90s, Independence Day. A glass and board and batten multi-decked architect's write-off on the sands. So good. Often I would stand at the deck railing of a warm summer's morning, watching a father and children on the beach, offspring doing what offspring do when they're alone with dad at the seaside. Build castles, dig to China, bury each other neck down. While the father stares off, reads a newspaper, talks on his phone, often in business attire. Now and then the children would raise an appeal that he noticed a delicious detail of their castle, built with only a tiny spade. The father would redirect his gaze, say a word, hike up his pants leg, squat for a closer look, offer an assessment, but then stand again as the children return to their pursuits and stare out at the ocean's sparkling palette toward a distant freighter, a windsurfer, a charter craft riding at anchor. I'm going through the motions here. I should be there his posture and gaze declared. I could be headed towards a new horizon, a different sunrise. Yet here I am on this continent's edge with my wee ones doing what life has ordained. It is not sad, not fraudulent in the least. Though, yes, there could be more or other. All the while, I was thinking, mug of strong coffee steaming on the deck rail, I know the hollow in the heart that is longing and longing's opposite doing good because you want to do good and are a good man in spite of what you know is true of you. Yes, happiness can still be yours, old chap, since happiness is not a pure element like manganese or boron, but an alloy of metals both precious and base and durable. But I'll, I'll say one short thing about that. Um, that passage originated in an experience we've all had, which is to say, looking out at a beach and seeing a father or a parent with a child doing what these people are said to be doing. And, and, and the part of it that matters to me the most is, again, I get to the end of that, and then I want to say, and therefore what? And therefore what? Because conventional wisdom might say that he stands and looks around and thinks about where he might be, that that's unhappy that that's melancholy. And what I want to be able to say, which is the question I ask myself all the time, 
and try to answer on the page. What can I say that will renew this? What can I say about this experience that will make it seem to be different from and more useful than it would be as conventional wisdom? So I can say that actually is fine. That actually is a, a, is a route to happiness rather than the more conventional route to melancholy. That's, the jo that's my job. Thank you for reading that. I wouldn't have read it that well. <laughs> Very kind of you to say. Um, questions, anyone? Yes, ma'am. Maybe, maybe we can get up. Do, do you mind? We won't hoot at you. That's all right. This will be painless. I know you've written a collection of short stories, and I know that writing short stories are, I think, more difficult than writing a novel. Is that true? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say it was, but, but, that, but, I, but, but that's a useful piece of information, I think, from a person who does both. Writing short stories is eminently easier than writing novels. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean short stories are building a, building a clock. Uh, writing a novel is inventing time. <laughs> Hello. I've read um, Sports Writer when it came out. I read uh, Independence Day. But I haven't read any of the others until this week and crammed for Be Mine. I told you there won't be a test. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Maybe uh, there will be one. But I did notice what I felt was a change in the voice. And that change was a more forgiving and more awareness of yourself, or of Frank's self. Does that uh, resonate with you? Well, that, that's... Did, did everybody hear that? Okay. Um, that's a very, for a guy who writes novels, that, that's a very complicated question. Um, but I'll answer the easy part of it first, which is to say that if you're writing a novel about a man who's 74, 75 years old, whose son is at age 47 dying of amyotropic lateral sclerosis, it, you are, it is incumbent upon you to be more forgiving. It is incumbent only because if you are more forgiving, you let in new language. And what you're trying to do is not exclude language. I mean, you, you know that if this is what's happening to him, that the father would necessarily be sympathetic, empathetic, uh, patient, uh, all those things. But you want to find language which actually is more rich than that. So it just behooves me in writing about that premise to find some way to let more language in. So that's, and I think that language serves what you just referred to. As far as the voice being different, you know, in my mind, all of those novels sound exactly alike, but they don't. The sentences are longer, the different, the different kinds of um, dependent clauses in them. There are, there are different kinds of uh, verb choices, different, different ways in which the book is humorous. And, 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 and that allows me to say this, and then I'll quit. We, all of us, everybody who has in his or her life a priest, a spouse, a child, somebody where you take your clothes to the cleaners, somebody where you get your car fixed, a voice for all of those kinds of transactions. But, and by, by that voice, what I mean is you have, a different, you have a different palette of words you choose from, you have a different tone that you choose from when you talk to the man who cleans out your garage from who from your priest. And so, again, I have a use for all those voices. And so it's not unusual for me to, to try to avail myself of a, of a voice that doesn't seem congenial to what I have been doing up to that point in the book, just to, again, expand my access to language. Because I think the reader will allow me to do it if I put on the page something that's interesting. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, can I ask a question then? Oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> um, 
who would you want us to be reading? I know you want us to be reading you, and we should be reading you, but if we weren't worried about having our prose monkeyed with by people who were writing similar stuff, yeah. who would you really recommend we be reading who's not Richard Ford? Christina and I, um, uh, Christina and I just read a book called Wolf at the Table by a man named Adam Rapp, who was a playwright. And it's, it's a very, very good book. And, um, and I just read a, a novel this week by an old friend of mine whose name is Howard A. Norman, who happens to live in Vermont. It's called Come to the Window. And it's set in um, 1918 in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, during the, uh, during the pandemic that was going on then, the uh, Spanish flu pandemic going on then. It's, and it's a short little novel of about 190 pages. And uh, of course, that's short to me. Um, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I read it in about two sittings. And you know, when, when, when your friends send you books, it's not always easy to love them. <laughs> you want to love them and you try to love them, but somehow it's just, it's just something weird about it. But I just completely tumbled to this book. So there are two. Okay, then, then let me recommend one then and then- Okay, um, do, please. Be Mine by Richard Ford. <laughs> it's, it's an astonishing book, and thank you for it. It was totally good. Well done. Well done.